Okay, it's 1101. So we're going to kick things off. Thank you all for coming to our third installment of the Princeton Mortgage Pro Series. Today's topic is achieving your dreams and being a go giver. So as usual, Mark Gordon is going to be our host and walk us through this presentation and we will email out a recording to everyone tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that. All right, Mark, let's get started. Thanks so much, Liz. I'm excited to do this for you guys. It's one of my favorite topics to do trainings on here at Princeton. Um, it's a huge part of what we do here in our selling system. And so I um, stumbled upon the book, The Go-Giver. Uh, when I first came to Princeton, it was recommended to me by a recruiter we had working here at the time. And it really changed my perspective on all of my relationships and sales and how I approach those relationships and really take away some of the icky feelings sometimes that people feel when they're doing prospecting and other stuff. And so I'm excited to dive into that with you guys. So before we hop into that, though, I do want to talk a little bit about the last two webinars, just so we can kind of recap and kind of see how all this stuff fits nicely together. Um, we're talking about detaching from the outcome, which is, you know, again, one of our ways we can start to feel better about prospecting, and also about the five laws of stratospheric success that are directly from the book, which co-author Bob Berg um, wrote, and uh, he's a big fan of ours, and we're a big fan of his, so... All right, so uh, uh, webinar one, sorry, was... Uh, Objectives and key results. This is our goal setting framework that we use here as part of our selling system. It was made famous by Google, but it's been around a whole lot longer than that. Um, and really what, what, what we, we wanna do is we wanna be better at achieving our dreams, right? And, and so um, having a framework where we say, this is our objective. This is my big, hairy, audacious goal. This is my why, right? And maybe it's to become the number one realtor in your area or to build a business doing X. And then what are the key results? What are the few but super important things that we're going to be able to measure each quarter or each year to determine whether or not we're on our path to get there? Having written down goals and sharing those with somebody gives you a 76% chance, according to some studies, of achieving them. Um, if you just kind of have a dream and you dream it and keep it in your head and it's whimsical, 8% or less, right? And so uh, really important to use a framework for achieving your results. In our second webinar, we talked about how do we achieve those results, right? So, so okay, cool. I have a dream. Here's what I'm going to measure. How do I do that stuff? Um, and so to-do lists are one of the worst ways to get things done because uh, not only are to 41% of the things on a to-do list never get done, and many things roll over from day to day or list to list, um, but they allow you to say yes to everything, which doesn't allow you to prioritize, right? And so when you say yes to something, you say no to something else. We talked about this that I think Warren Buffett has a quote where it's um, uh, successful people, um, the most successful people say no to almost everything, right? And so, and so knowing what you need to say no to comes from having a scorecard for your important but not urgent activities each week and having a calendar so that you know what you're saying no to when you say yes to something else and so that you can remember to do that thing. But also when it's on a to-do list, it kind of nags at you once it's in your calendar, it's as if it's already done. So how does the go-giver stuff apply? Well, now we know, we know where we want to go. And we know what we're going to measure. And we know when we're going to do this. We know what we're going to do and when we're going to do it, right? How do we execute on the what we're going to do, right? And, and specifically for sales, this is, this is what, it, what it really applies to. So this is Bob Berg. He's the co-author of The Go-Giver. And um, he's, he's talking about Princeton. He, he, we've had a bunch of interactions with him and this is a quote he gave about us. These people are laser focused on bringing value to everyone they serve. Follow the example set by Princeton Mortgage and you will not only survive, but you will thrive. So that meant a lot to us, by the way, that he, he felt that when he came here. That was part of our initial design when we came together four years ago to build the company. So what is the purpose? Prospecting is, is something that salespeople all know they should be doing and is a difference, but we don't want to do it. And one of the reasons we don't want to do it is it feels icky. And so we talk about, I was going to talk about car dealerships. It's an experience that most of us have had that we can relate to in sales. What ha Anybody here, what happens when you go to a car dealership to buy a specific car and when you get there, they don't have the car you want? How does the car dealer, the car salesman respond? Anybody want to help me out and take a stab at it? They're going to talk you into something else. They're going to talk you into something else, right? So immediately it's like, well, we don't have that car, but let me go show you this other one. Right. And immediately you feel like you're being sold and it's an icky feeling. And so oftentimes we then relate our own prospecting to that experience, which is you're thinking about what you want going into that call. Right. So why am I prospecting? I'm hoping this person's going to use me as their listing agent, I'm hoping this person's going to use me as their buying agent. Right. 
And so you're hoping for that, those types of things, or on the mortgage side of things, if you're calling a realtor, I'm hoping this person's going to refer me business. If you go into that, you're putting your interests above everything else. And we intrinsically know that that's icky because we don't like it when people do it to us. And so the, the go-giver flipped all of this on its head for me. So the first thing you want to do is when you're prospecting, you want to detach from the outcome, right? Process over results, right? You know, and because here's what happens, right? No one wants to be sold. And so when you do your prospecting and someone says, hey, I'm not interested, what does that do to us? It creates a panic response. We can get used to it over time, but actually initially it feels like we're being rejected. And the reason why being rejected feels like a panic response is very evolutionarily. When you live in small groups of people, if you were rejected by that group, you can literally die, right? Survival of the fittest in evolution, you know, being rejected by your small group of people could literally be the difference between life or death. And so we hate as people to put ourselves in a position where we can get rejected. And so, but it, so if we make our prospecting calls and we get out of the outcome, right? Say, hey, I'm going to make my calls and I'm actually not going to expect anything from this call. The goal is to make the call and follow my process. We start to, and, and someone says to you, hey, I'm not interested. That's a result that we're looking for. And we start making that a positive experience for ourselves, right? So say, hey, listen, I'm going to make 50, 50 contacts today. I'm going to get a result from those calls. The result can become the win, detached from the outcome. That will make us feel better about our prospect. But the five laws of stratospheric success take that to an entirely different place. So the first thing is the law of value, right? We are making value decisions as people all of the time, right? Hey, someone stops you. You're walking down the street. Someone's like, hey, can I get a minute of your time? And you're making a snap judgment at that moment. 90% of the time, you'll probably just keep walking. But occasionally, someone might grab your attention in the right way. And for some reason at that moment, maybe you're not as busy. Maybe they're physically attractive to you. Maybe it's the way they're, they're confident in that moment. But you will stop and have that conversation. And we're doing that subconsciously. We're making a value decision in that very specific moment. Am I going to stop or not stop? We make hundreds of those decisions over the course of a normal week. You're flipping through the channels. You can see that it's a little bit old school for some people when we used to flip through channels. And uh, you get you go through it, and it's like you get to the, you're on that channel for two seconds. And you're making a value decision. It doesn't cost you anything to, um, monetarily to stay on that channel, but it does cost you time. Did you see something in those two seconds that make it worth it for you to give it another two seconds and another two seconds? So we're making those value decisions all the time. Well, when we make value decisions, right, the law of value is your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment, right? And these are decisions we make all of the time, right? So one of my favorite examples of this is McDonald's. McDonald's serves like 100 billion plus people, whatever, you know, the number billions and billions serve. Maybe they stopped counting at some point, but it's like a trillion people that give them burgers to. It's pretty successful. And it's because we make a value decision when we go to McDonald's. I remember when I was a kid, a McDonald's cheeseburger cost 59 cents and it was 69 cents if you added cheese. And I was like, oh my God, I can eat food for 69 cents. But I remember this as a kid. It's a little bit more expensive now, right? $7.99 for a meal. But if that same meal costs $15 or $20, no one would go to McDonald's, right? The value of McDonald's is that the food is pretty good, super fast, and super cheap, right? But if we were at a steakhouse and they served us a McDonald's burger, we'd probably be disappointed. You'd ask for a medium rare and they'd be like, I don't think that's how this works. You can't get it your way, right? So that's not the process, right? So it's a value decision based on that price point. McDonald's consistently delivers more in value than they expect in payment. Another awesome example of this is Netflix, right? How many of you guys get more than $12 a month out of your Netflix subscription? Well, the answer is even if you don't, you're, you, you could. There's an unlimited amount of content. You could literally watch TV all day, every day for the rest of this year, and you would never get through all the content available to you on Netflix. It's a tremendous amount of value. But if Netflix charged $100 a month, you'd start to feel very differently about that product. Netflix was successful and got 100, 100 plus million subscribers because they delivered more in value than they accepted in payment. And so in your business, how does that translate? People have a very specific expectation of what a realtor is supposed to do right? You're, if you're a listing agent, you're supposed to get my stuff listed. You're supposed to get it online. You're supposed to put the sign in front of the house. You're supposed to have an open house. You don't get any points for that. Now, if you don't do that stuff, you deliver less in value than they expect, and you're going to get crushed. But that's the minimum. That's what they expect. If you want to deliver more in value as a realtor, what does that mean for you? 
It means you're doing things that people don't expect, right? Are you going the extra mile to make sure that the house is, is staged correctly, right? Are you making the, the experience enjoyable? Because sometimes just the experience of meeting with, of doing this with someone you like and trust can be extra value, right? Anybody have any other ways as a realtor that they think they add extra value to their clients that isn't expected, but they kind of have their thing they want to share? On the buyer side, you know, certainly connections with mortgage lenders, insurance, if they, you know, haven't had a previous contact, um, you know, vendors for repairs, you know, both on the buyer and seller side. I mean, there are a number of things. I mean, my approach is trying to be one-stop shop for all my clients, regardless of whether it's buyer or seller. Yeah. So you want to sell your house, you make the phone call to me. I handle everything else to make sure that's an amazing experience for you. Not just the selling of the house, but everything to prep for it, all the different stuff. Amazing. Right. Anyone else have any other secrets of the trade? We, we're yes. no this is Nicole. And I'd Wonderful. like to say what I did on my last sale. Um, sure. I had an older client in her late seventies and she was moving from a single family resident to a, a condo. So she had <clears throat> no experience with uh, HOAs. So I actually read all the HOA documents, sifted through them, made sure that the most important ones were in a group and printed out for her to keep and um, just made sure she knew where to get information from the HOA. And, you know, you don't usually have to read all that stuff, but I mean, there was a lot in this place, but there's no way she could have handled that on her own. So it's a perfect example of something that's not part of your job that you did because you saw somebody in need and now that person's going to become a raving fan of you. You deliver something they didn't expect, right? For the same yeah, payment, she, who has her payment involved, and she's going to be, go ahead. She's really my fan right now. <laughs> of course. And so, so what we need to ask in our own business, whether you're a realtor or a loan officer or in any other service-based industry, right? Even if you're McDonald's is, how can I make everybody walk away from this going, wow, I got a lot for what I paid. I got more than I expected from this situation. And so that's the law of value. So as you sit there and put your business plan together for this year and you think about what, how you're going to attract prospects and referrals and different things is I need to make sure that every, I know what my value proposition is. And I know that I'm always delivering more in value than people expect. So this is a quote from Jeff Bezos Amazon. We're not competitor obsessed, we're customer obsessed. We start with what the customer needs and we work backwards. Additionally, what he said is their business strategy is to deliver what their customers want at a price where they can make a profit. And so it's as simple as that. So what happened? Oh, so our law of compensation, right? So we have our law of value, deliver more in value than people expect, deliver more in value than you accept in payment, right? And so that's, that's, that's one part of it, number one. Number two, though, is your law of compensation. Your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So if you're the most amazing realtor in the world because you'll spend four weeks working on the project with somebody and that takes you away so you can only help one client every month, that will really limit the amount of people, the amount of people that you can serve and as a result, the amount of compensation that you can make. So a huge part of this is you want to be able to serve a lot of people. Right. And there's a number of different components to that. One is the time that you have, the scalability of your business, how, and, and the amount of people that you're able to attract. So McDonald's makes a lot of money charging $7 a burger. And they made a lot of money back when they were charging 59 cents a burger because they do billions and billions of dollars in business. LeBron James plays basketball and it's free for me. Once you have your TV or you can go on the NBA app and watch those games for free every single night. He makes money off of advertisement, but the reason he makes $100 million a year in endorsements is because he's delivering a ton of entertainment at a price that's essentially free other than my time of watching an advertisement, right? Amazon, everybody here is getting shipments sent to their house from Amazon. That's how they make all that money. So it, this seems pretty obvious, right, in terms of how to do it, but it's hard to just serve at scale, especially as an individual business owner or a realtor, right? So as you continue to serve more and more people, how can you spend time on the vital few activities that only you can do that do deliver exceptional value more than people expect? And what can you continue to take off your plate or put towards other people to help you continue to expand your business? 
So the law of influence. Okay, cool. So I'm delivering more in value than people expect. I'm delivering more than they expect from their transactions. I'm doing it for a bunch of people, right? But how do I how do I get to a place where I'm able to convince people to either use me or use my mortgage company if I'm referring them or use this other service that's going to help me get my business going? The law of influence. We make decisions about who we listen to and who influences us every single day. The best way to get influence over people is to make them feel like you're putting their interests above your own. The best referral sources, some of the best referral sources I've ever gotten in this industry are people that I was either trying to recruit and then through the recruitment process, I said, you know, based on your business, we're actually not the right fit for you. You should try these people. Or based on the mortgage needs you have, I'm not the right mortgage guy. You should go talk to this person. Those people immediately trust me and become raving fans who refer other people. Because in that moment, they know there's nothing in it for me, and I'm still doing what's right for them. So the people in your life that you do stuff for, where they can feel you're interested in helping them before, and you know that if you help enough people, this is, so it's very simple for me. I, this was not how I operated before I read this book. I was always trying to win every conversation. I was trying to get what was in it for me. And instinctively over the years, I realized I didn't have to operate that way, but I still was thinking of it that way. But once I said, man, if I can go deliver value to tons of people, right? I deliver value, but then, you know, more than they expect. I do it for a lot of people. And if I can put, always put their interests above my own and the money's going to find me, right? So if I'm a realtor in my community, everybody knows that I'm a realtor, right? I'm always delivering more than people expect. People are enjoying their experience with me and working with me, right? And they always feel like I'm putting their interests first. I'm, the money is going to find me. The business is going to find you. People are going to come. They're going to be attracted to working with somebody like that because it's so rare. And we have really good, highly evolved instincts to filter through this stuff. The reason why con men or confidence men, we make movies about them, is that's a very rare person that can go around and fool everybody. For the most part, we're pretty good as, pe at pe uh, as people of figuring out who has their interest at heart and who has our interest at heart. And a lot of times you'll literally, I mean, for me, I will literally feel the hair in the back of my neck stand up when I can feel someone who's only interested in what's in it for them. My body is literally saying, run away from this person. I have a physical reaction to it. And so now I just put everybody's influence, I put, I put everybody's interest above my own. So when I have my sales team here, you'll never hear me talk about what's in it for me if they grow their business. I'm always focused in it, what's in it for them. This training today, I'm focused on how you guys can grow your business, right? I know that if we continue to deliver value in trainings, people are gonna to wanna to come work with Princeton. Right. And so all those different things and influences, how can I put somebody else's interest above my own? And so if everyone's feeling that from you, you're going to attract people. Right. And so um, I'll give you, you know, my, my, the, I think the loan officer example is actually the best one for this. If as a loan officer, you say, hey, I really appreciate you taking a shot with me, but I'm not the right guy for this. If you're doing a 203K loan, I've never done one before. You should go talk to this guy. That person is going to trust you on everything from that moment forward. Right. And so We've all had that feeling where you're like, man, I think I could probably get this client or I could probably get this thing, but I may not be the right person, right person for that. What we do in those moments will determine the amount of influence we continue to have over people in our lives. Fourth law, the law of authenticity. The most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself and, all, and the techniques and all the skills are for not if you're not authentic and if you don't come across as authentic. So when I first read this, my thought on this was like, oh, I should have to be me. So easy, I could be me, just to be me. But it's a lot more complicated than that. Because what I realized is to be me and to still attract people, I had to do a bunch of work on me, right? So if being me is not a version of me that other people are gonna to wanna to work with, then, I, then what ends up happening is you end up faking it, right? You end up trying to be fake, trying to pretend you're somebody that you're not to try to keep attracting people to you. But that doesn't work. And so when I say being authentic, it doesn't necessarily just mean like, oh, just be authentic to yourself and the people who want to work with you or to be the people that don't, don't. For me, it actually means putting the work in to become the person worthy of attracting more people to want to work with me, right? So if I want to be a sales leader in the mortgage industry just for myself, and I, and I, I relate these things to me because I think that there's an honesty in the training for it, then I need to be the best sales leader for people to come work for. I need to go do the work to make that happen. I need to read the books. I need to get the practice in. I need to to continue to make sure that my mental health is in a really good place so I can help other people through their stuff. And so my, my level of authenticity isn't just saying I'm going to be being me. It's saying, how do I truly become the person that I need to be in order to attract the people that I want to work with and do that extra work? 
So for as a realtor, it might be making sure you're doing that market research, making sure you're taking classes on contracts and you understand how to go through the negotiation process and your team, you become an expert on it, right? Making sure you're going to network events so you know the other realtors in the community. So in a competitive offer situation, you have a relationship that might help get your offer accepted. I know, that's, I know we're not supposed to say that that's a thing, but obviously it is because we're human. How do you offer additional value? How do you put the work into you so that your most authentic self, you're comfortable with that, and that does add the most amount of value. So being authentic is not enough if the current you is not worthy of the success you want. You must do the work to become the best version of yourself so that you can share that person with others authentically. And the last uh, law of the go-giver is the law of receptivity. And believe it or not, in many ways, this is the one I personally struggled with the most. When I go out with my friends, I love to be the guy that buys drinks. I love to be the guy that picks up the bill. When somebody else offers to pay up the bill for me, I get mad. I get like, I literally, like, I'm like, Don't, if you pay for me, we're going to fight about it later. Like I literally, it's like my natural reaction. And my, my friends, and by the way, like I, like, it's like I didn't want anybody to do anything for me. There was like this weird feeling. But actually what I was doing is I was robbing that other person of having the same feeling that I enjoy so much. That person is saying, hey, man, I want to buy you a drink. And I'm like, no, no, don't do that. Instead of saying thank you and being open to receiving, giving that person the, giving that person the beautiful moment of being able to be a go-giver and give, I was robbing them of that selfishly because I didn't want to feel in debt to that person. And so I had to really work on this. This is something I'm still working on, it, but it was a lot of work. It was how can I be open to receiving? And maybe it's that I don't feel worthy. I don't want to feel in debt to somebody else or whatever else it is. We cost ourselves a ton of business because we don't think we're ready for a certain thing instead of just saying thank you and giving and allowing that other person to have that moment of giving. So the natural result of a life full of giving is that you'll begin to receive. You must stay open to receptivity in all of its forms. Gifts, invitations out to dinner, and being connected to another person in your field might not seem like it's going to lead directly to new business. However, as a go-giver, because you're in those situations, what are you doing? You're putting, you're delivering more to people than they expect. You're talking to lots of people. You're putting their interests above your own, right? And you've done the work to become an awesome, authentic version of yourself. Now you're out there. You have to be open to be receiving. You've done the hard work. You are putting other people's interests first. Of course, you deserve it, and it's going to come back to you. So you're not in it for more business, but you're looking to build meaningful relationships. Allow others to give to you the way you've given to them. So really hard for certain people. Easier for others. So here's what this all comes down to. When you're making that cold call, right? You're making that cold call. It feels icky because in your head, you're like, this person doesn't want to hear from me because they know I'm about to ask them for something. Flip the script on its head. I'm calling this person to see if there's any way I can deliver value to them. And I, this is not, I, I literally changed my mindset to this place. Instead of going to meet with this realtor to look for a referral, go meet with this realtor and say, there's any way you can deliver value to them. Maybe they're moving soon and they need somebody to help them pick up a couch. Volunteer for that. There's nothing in it for you, but you're putting their interests above your own and you're looking for ways to deliver value. I happen to be a bigger guy who can carry a couch. If they need a couch carried, I'll do that. I started looking for opportunity in every conversation with every person for how I could help them get to where they wanted to go. And that became my mantra. And so now when I call somebody to prospect, I don't feel icky. This person's not in the mood to talk to me today that says more about them than it does about me. I'm not calling to ask for anything. I'm calling to see if there's anything that I can give, if there's any service that I can provide. And we talk about our four conversations, which is we're looking for to talk about things like family, occupation, recreation, or dreams, right? We might be looking for hints or clues, right? Is there, is there some sort of life-changing event that's happening for this person that may make them likely to buy or sell real estate in the near future? right? But I'm only looking for that to see if there's an opportunity for me to deliver value to this person. I'm an expert on real estate. I've done the hard work. I know the area. I believe that I'd probably be a really good candidate to help this person with whatever their next home purchase is or the selling of their home. I'm always looking for ways to deliver value. If there are other ways I can deliver value to this person, maybe make a recommendation. Maybe they're looking for a new dentist and I happen to have one that I love, right? Maybe they need a tire change and I know a mechanic that can help them out. And maybe that mechanic is a friend of mine because they helped them out with something else previously. And now I can connect to those two people. The best realtors and salespeople, especially community-based salespeople like real estate agents, are connecting people all the time because they're always putting their value above everyone else's. And those prospecting calls 
are now just calls to see if you can deliver value and build a relationship. And it takes all of the ickiness away. I'm not calling today to find somebody I can sell a house to. I'm calling today to expand my network and build relationships with people to see how I can deliver value to them in any way that I possibly can. That's a beautiful thing. And if so you can get yourself there, you can get rid of all of the ickiness that's come, that comes, with, comes from that. Um, sorry, my mouse, my mouse is very sensitive. All right, guys, so I'll turn the floor over here. Does anybody else have any, any questions about the go-giver or how to implement these strategies? It's a pretty short book, guys, too. I always recommend it by its two, two to three hours. Also, it's a great book to give out as a gift to other people in the industry or people that you want to have influence with. Um, I always have a couple of copies with me that I, that I give out to people. It's, it's a very light read. It's, it's told through a story of a guy who's going on a journey and encounters all these different principles together. Mark, what, go ahead. what was the hardest law or the rule for, from the book for you to implement? Well, I don't know. I actually found it all pretty easy once I had the framework and I committed to it. But the one that really blew my mind was the influence one. Because once, it, once I read it, it was so obvious to me. And it's something that I intuitively knew, but I didn't have a framework for it in my head that like, so like there were definitely times where I, I always knew I wanted to do the right thing by people. And I did. And there were plenty of times where I did put their interests above my own. But sometimes that I used to feel, I used to feel I used to do it and I used to do it like through, with a kind of a sick feeling. Like, man, like, like, oh, like, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to send this person to the right place, but like, it just didn't feel right. I, I feel like I was losing something by, by making that recommendation and giving it away. Um, and instead, this changed for me where I now I feel like I was getting something from that opportunity because I started to really believe it would come back around. And it has. It was a tremendous change for me. It always comes back around. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Mark, I just finished up the book um, recently recently actually for the first time and one of the things that jumped out at me was the three reasons that people work right to survive to save uh and to serve and i, I was just hoping you might be able to dig into that a little bit more because i think I, I could just imagine the pressure on some people that are kind of just trying to get by or just trying or trying to save with this idea of like hey you know no just give don't try to sell just give like so what like what are your thoughts on that when you're talking to loan officers and real and real estate agents so glad you brought that up. I think I missed my cue and talk about that during the presentation a little bit too, because I did want to talk about it. So um, yeah, this is, listen, this is a really difficult thing to do if you're starving. It's really difficult. If you don't have enough money to pay your bills right now, or you're under your own financial pressure, it is almost impossible to authentically put other people's interests above your own, right? And so people, I think, confuse that sometimes, right? They say, okay, well, I got to make money before I do this stuff, and I'm going to run around and hustle. I actually find that one of the things I really counsel people to do is sort of change their mindset about their own situation. And oftentimes they have to change your spending habits or get a second job or whatever else it is to put yourself in a better position because you can't cheat that first step a lot of the time, right? And so, yes, it is about, you know, you, it was to survive, to, to, to thrive and to serve. Uh, save, yeah, survive, save and, and serve. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, there were, I was fortunate enough to grow up where if I ever would have really screwed up, I could have slept gone at home and slept in my parents' house. So I had that as a backdrop. So I didn't, so that allowed me to skip some of that stuff. But I have seen times where people are desperate and desperate people have a really hard time focusing on these things because they act from a place of desperation. I've also seen lots of people who, who are what I call create artificial desperation for themselves. In other <laughs> words, they have a bunch of money in the, they have enough money, they have enough things, they're not gonna be homeless but they created some idea for where they need to be to feel successful. And so they're desperately chasing that next thing. And that ends up feeling the same way to people, but it's, but it's really artificial. And so when you ask yourself like, hey, I know I, I need to make more money. Well, unless you're actually starving or behind on your bills, it's not coming from a need place. And so the question is, how can I better serve others and knowing and having trust and faith, honestly, that that is gonna come back around the other way because it always does. And so, you know, yes, when, when, we, when we are up against our survival instincts, it's almost impossible to put somebody else's interest above our own. But if we, once we're out of that place, we need to be able to shift and get into that other way. So how do I get out of that place? And then how do I shift? Thanks for asking, Dan. Thank Any you. other questions? All right, guys. Well, 
I appreciate you guys coming. Um, if, you have, if you think of anything, uh, definitely reach out. Um, one thing I will say is if you're interested in the book and you love it, Bob Berg is the author. He's on Twitter. And you, if you reach out to him, he usually responds. And so if you have questions for him, you can certainly reach out there. Uh, but I really love this book. It was a game changer for me and, for, and even how we teach sales here at Princeton. Um, it really went from, hey, we need to get more loans. We need to get more business. We need to do this too. How can we become the people worthy of attracting more people to want to work with us? And what's the work that we can do and how do we put other people's needs above our own? And that shift uh, had a radical difference for us. And I hope it does for you as well. Thank you guys so much for coming. Hey, Mark, I want to thank you. I really appreciate these. They're very useful to me. Oh, thank you so much for coming, Nicole. And if there's ever anything else or any other suggestions for topics you have, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to, uh, to continue to, to deliver as much on these as we possibly can. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur.